the message I have for today, uh, I'll, I'll admit, I, I've kind of agonized over it a little bit. It's not a happy message at all. Uh, for me, my background, uh, I'm an IT. I grew up uh, uh, studying, I went to Purdue, or excuse me, I went to Rose Hallman for mechanical engineering, then I went to Purdue for aeronautical technology, and now I work at Cummins in IT. And uh, I grew up going to church. I went to a Presbyterian church. Has anybody ever heard of Presbyterians? Yes. Yeah. Has anybody My ever? My grandma used to be a Presbyterian. Used to be a Presbyterian. Uh, we had, once had a pastor, a visiting pastor, say that he called us the frozen chosen. Very, if, if you want to pick the extreme opposite of Pentecostal, that's a, a Presbyterian. And so on that opposite end, we we're very stoic. So I grew up, I heard about God, heard the stories. But when I got into my college years, I had a lot of doubt. Uh, my brother and I, we grew up in the same household, but he's now an atheist. So he's completely walked away from the Lord. But I finally, when my, our first daughter was born, that's when I began to challenge God, if you can challenge God. And I said, God, if you are who you claim to be, you have to prove it to me. And I was just like Timothy. Timothy had said, look, unless I see you know, the holes in his hands and the, the, the gap, gap in his side, I'm not going to believe. And I was that person. And thankfully, what Jesus did, if you remember what Jesus did, what did he do? He provided the evidence. The evidence that he needed in order to believe. And so from that began a journey of me searching out pretty much every question and every doubt I ever had. And now I have a website, it's called godsproof.com. If you're interested, uh, if you ever have any doubts about anything, it's called godsproof.com. It's a website out there which has, it's not, doesn't have a lot of original content, but what it does have is links to websites, books, magazines, and other types of things. So if you ever doubt anything about the Word of God, the Word of, the Lord Himself has provided the proof that you can need, that you need in order to believe. If you remember when Jesus was talking, he says, If you don't believe my words, believe the works that I do, for they testify that I'm of the Father. Amen. And even after the resurrection, in the, in the book of Acts, it says, By many infallible proofs, he showed himself who he was. See, God doesn't want you to have a blind faith. See, I grew up in the Presbyterian church, and they told me that Christianity is a blind faith. Christianity is not a blind faith. A blind faith is believing in something without anything to bear witness to that. You know, somebody once brought up the example of Jeff. Well, when you get on a plane, you don't worry about that plane. I said, well, actually, if every plane that went up, if 50% of them came back down and crashed, I probably wouldn't fly a plane. But there's plenty of evidence and proof that bears witness that I can trust that plane. Well, there's plenty of proof and evidence that bears witness that you can trust Jesus Christ. And if you have any kind of doubt, he will shred that doubt. He will do it, he will do it very kindly, too. <laughs> Sometimes very pointedly as well. So that's that's my background. That's where I kind of come from. Uh, I had a lot of doubt, but once the Lord finally took me through all my doubts, I came to the place where I now stand on the Word of God as, as the Word of God. It is not man's Word. It is God's Word that He has passed down to us. And so part of that Word I want to bring to you this morning, um, and like I said, this is kind of a difficult message to bring because it's not a happy message. It's reflective of what's going on in our country today. How many of you would say that our country is deeply divided? Yep. Has any of you ever seen it this divided Never. before? Never. Never. Okay. Yeah. So if we take a look, all the politicians that are sitting there, all the pundits, all the commentators, everybody has a solution, right? Yeah. Everybody has a solution as to how to fix this problem. But the evidence of what's going on in our country is being now openly discussed. For example, I, mean, I have to take my glasses off, my eyes are bad. For example, Congressman Steve King of the 4th Congressional District of Iowa is now openly warning that we are seeing the precursor events to a hot civil war. We are now starting to see actually sitting politicians who are saying we are seeing the precursor events to something very terrible that's going to take place. And these people are not Christians, these are not prophets, these are not watchmen. These are secular people that are now saying this very same thing. We're also seeing, for example, a famous documentary producer and director, Dinesh D'Souza, recently released a new film entitled Death of America, 
Can We Save America a second time? And also on a June 25th USA Today op-ed piece entitled, Is America Headed Toward a Civil War? The writer said that incidents taking place in America show it has already begun. It goes on to say that author and journalist Tom Ricks, who specializes in military and national security issues, when asked whether we're heading towards a civil war, he answered, I don't believe we're to Kansas of the 1850s yet, but we seem to be lurching in that direction. When he mentioned Kansas of 1850, which was known as Blood Bleeding Kansas, Bloody Kansas, or the Border War, he was referring to a series of violent civil confrontations in the United States between, between 1854 and 1861. It emerged from a political and ideological debate over the legality of, of slavery in the proposed state of Kansas. Its severity made national he headlines which suggested to the American people that the disputes were unlikely to reach compromise without bloodshed, and it therefore directly presaged the American Civil War. In other words, Bloody Kansas was just a forerunner to the American Civil War which lasted from 1861 to 1865. And this military and national security expert believes that we are seeing history repeat itself again. In another article written by Michael Snyder of the Economic uh, Collapse Wall, he said, Civil wars don't emerge out of a vacuum. You can easily see them coming a long way away, and they are the result of tensions that build up over a long period of time. America is a very deeply divided nation, and it is getting worse with each passing day. So therefore, if you listen to enough of the news, enough of politicians, newscasters, and pretty much any man on the street, they will tell you a solution to this problem. But if I may, I would like to read to you one solution that was actually proposed by the President of the United States. And it was a proclamation that he gave. This is very surprising. It says here, a proclamation, whereas the Senate of the United States, devoutly recognizing the supreme authority and just government of Almighty God and all the affairs of men and of nations, has by a resolution requested the President to designate and set apart a day for national prayer and humiliation. And whereas it is the duty of nations as well as of men to own their dependence upon the overruling power of God, to confess their sins and transgressions in humble sorrow, yet with assured hope that genuine repentance will lead to mercy and pardon, and to recognize the sublime truth announced in the Holy Scriptures and proven by all history, that those nations only are blessed whose God is the Lord. And inasmuch as we know that by His divine law, nations like individuals are subjected to punishments and chastisements in this world, may we not justly fear that the awful calamity of civil war which now desolates the land may be but a punishment inflicted upon us, for our presumptuous sins to the needful end of our national refor reformation as a whole people. We have been the recipients of the choicest bounties of heaven. We have been preserved these many years in peace and prosperity. We have grown in numbers, wealth, and power as no other nation has ever grown. But we have forgotten God. We have gotten the gracious hand, we have forgotten the gracious hand which preserved us in peace and multiplied and enriched and strengthened us. And we have vainly imagined, in the deceitfulness of our hearts, that all those blessings were produced by some wisdom, superior wisdom and virtue of our own. Intoxicated with unbroken success, we have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace, too proud to pray to the God that made us. It behooves us then to humble ourselves before the offended power, to confess our national sins, and to pray for clemency and forgiveness. Now, therefore, in compliance with the request and fully concurring in the views of the Senate, I do, by this my proclamation, designate and set apart Thursday, the 30th day of April, 1863, as a day of national humiliation, fasting, and prayer. And I do hereby request all the people to abstain on that day from their ordinary secular pursuits and to unite at their several places of public worship and their respective homes in keeping the day holy to the Lord and devoted to the humble discharge of the religious duties proper to that solemn occasion. All this being done in the sincerity and truth, let us then rest humbly in the hope authorized by the divine teachings that the united cry of the nation will be heard on high and answered with blessings 
no less than the pardon of our national sins and the restoration of our now divided and suffering country to its former happy condition of unity and peace. In witness thereof, I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the United States to be affixed, done at the city of Washington this 30th day of March in the year of our Lord, 1,863, and of the independence of the United States, the 86th, by the President, Abraham Lincoln. Regardless of what you think of President Lincoln, he knew that the solution was not going to be found in the halls of government. It was not going to be found among the pundits. It was not even going to be found among the common men. It was only going to be found in the Lord. Amen. And much like the king of the city of Nineveh that Jonah prophesied to, President Lincoln too humbled himself and called the whole nation to repentance. Biblical scholars believe that Jonah preached the destruction of Nineveh around 800 B.C., while the destruction took place around 650 B.C., roughly 150 years after they repented as a nation, were they then finally destroyed. It's interesting, or shall I say unnerving, to know that it's been a little over 150 years since the end of the first Civil War in, in 1865. Have we, like Nineveh, run out of time? I believe the answer to that question will be up to those in this nation that call themselves by His name. Are we going to keep on sinning, or will we repent? Are we going to continue to praise men and give praise to men that belongs to God? Or are we going to praise God? Are we going to continue to focus on things like wealth and prosperity rather than on holiness and in righteousness? Like I said before, our hope does not rest in the, to, in the politicians or the pundits or the presbyteries. Our hope never rested among men. It has always rested in Jesus Christ. Amen. If you do have your Bibles, or if you want to write this down, you can turn with me to Amos chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. This is Amos chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. It says, Can two walk together except they be agreed? Will a lion roar in the forest when he hath no prey? Will a young lion cry out of his den if he have taken nothing? Can a bird fall in a snare upon the earth where no gin is for him? Shall one take up a snare from the earth and have taken nothing at all? Shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? Shall, shall there be evil in a city and the Lord hath not done it? And this is the key verse. Surely the Lord will do nothing but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. The lion hath roared, who will not fear? The Lord God hath spoken, who can but prophesy? If this is true, that our country is headed for another civil war, a good question to ask is, did the Lord warn us like he said he would do in Amos? The answer, of course, is yes, he did. In 1984, Romanian pastor Dimitri Dudeman was given a vision of what was to befall America in the future. The following is taken from his book, Dreams and Visions from God. This was written down in September of 1984, exactly 34 years ago. This was written shortly after arriving in America after being exiled by the Romanian government for smuggling Bibles into the Romanian country and also into Russia for many years. The title of it is The Message for America. And it goes like this. Late one night, I could not sleep. The children were sleeping on the luggage. My wife and daughter were crying. I went outside and walked around. I didn't want them to see me cry. I walked around the building crying and saying, God, why did you punish me? Why did you bring me into this country? I can't understand anybody. If I try to ask anybody anything, all I hear is, I don't know. I stopped in front of the apartment and sat on a large rock. Suddenly a bright light came toward me. I jumped to my feet because it looked as if a car was coming directly at me, attempting to run me, over, run me down. I thought the Romanian secret police had tracked me to America, and now they were trying to kill me. But it wasn't a car at all. As the light approached, it surrounded me. From the light, I heard the same voice that I heard so many times when I was in prison. He said, Dimitri, why are you so despaired? I said, why did you punish me? Why did you bring me to this country? I have nowhere to lay my head. I can't understand anybody. He said, Dimitri, didn't I tell you I am here with you also? 
I brought you to this country because this country will burn. I said, then why did you bring me here to burn? Why didn't you let me die in my own country? You should have let me die in jail in Romania. He said, Dimitri, have patience so I can tell you. Get on this. I got on something next to me. I don't know what it was. I also know that it was, I was not asleep. It was not a dream. It was not a vision. I was awake just as I am now. He showed me all of California and said, this is Sodom and Gomorrah. All of this in one day it will burn. took me to Las Vegas. This is Sodom and Gomorrah. In one day it will burn. Then he showed me the state of New York. Do you know what this is? He asked. I said no. He said this is New York. This is Sodom and Gomorrah. In one day it will burn. Then he showed me all of Florida. This is Florida. He said this is Sodom and Gomorrah, and one day it will burn. Then he took me back home to the rock where he had begun. And one day it will burn. All of this I have shown you. I said, how will it burn? He said, remember what I am telling you. Because you will go on television, on the radio, and in churches. You must yell with a loud voice. Do not be afraid, because I will be with you. I said, how will it be, how would it be able to go? Who knows me here in America? I don't know anybody here, he said. Don't worry yourself. I will go before you. I will do a lot of healing in the American churches, and I will open the doors for you. But do not say anything else besides what I tell you. This country will burn. I said, what will you do with the church? He said, I want to save the church, but the churches have forsaken me. I said, how did they forsake you? He said, the people praise themselves. The honor that the people are supposed to give Jesus Christ, they take upon themselves. In the churches, there are divorces. There is adultery in the churches. There are homosexuals in the churches. There is abortion in the churches. And all other sins are possible. Because of all the sin, I have left some of the churches. You must yell in a loud voice that they must put an end to their sinning. They must turn toward the Lord. The Lord never gets tired of forgiving. They must draw close to the Lord and live a clean life. If they have sinned until now, they must put an end to it and start a new life as the Bible tells them to live. I said, how will America burn? America is the most powerful country in this world. Why did you bring us here to burn? Why did you at least let us die where all the Deutemans have died? He said, remember this, Dimitri, and hear this. This is me talking. This is important. He said, Dimitri, remember this. The Russian spies have discovered where the nuclear warehouses are in America. When the Americans will think that it is peace and safety, from the middle of the country, some of the people will start fighting against the government. The government will be busy with internal problems. Then from the ocean, from Cuba, Nicaragua, Mexico. He told me two other countries, but I didn't remember what they were. They will bomb the nuclear warehouses. When they explode, America will burn. What will you do with the church of the Lord? How will you save the ones that will turn toward you? I asked, he said, tell them this. I, how I saved the three young ones from the furnace of fire and how I saved Daniel in the lion's den is the same way I will save them. Now you can read the rest of this vision on their ministry's website, handofhelp.com. Um, if you'd also like to write these down, if you have a pen and paper, the angel told Dimitri to turn to these scriptures for proof of what is to come. Jeremiah chapter 51, verses 8 through 15, Revelation 18, and Zechariah chapter 14. To put this vision in context, this was given before the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989 and the fall of the Soviet Union in 1990 91. 
For many years after the fall of communism in Europe, it was crazy to think that Russia could ever be able to come against the United States. But now that doesn't seem far-fetched. In fact, it's now becoming headline news that Russia is preparing its people for war. There are two things that, are, that we are seeing take place today that Dmitry mentioned over 33 years ago. And we would have not seen it even in the past two years up until recently. The first one is mentioning that the government will be busy with internal problems. Never before has a sitting president been inundated with such immense internal problems and strife. Many refer to this opposition as the deep state. And elected officials are pushing back against our president. The other is that some of the people will start fighting against the government. Never since the first civil war have we seen such hatred and vitriol coming from not only the people, but also from the mainstream media, Hollywood, corporate America, academia, and the political parties all at once and at such high levels. Elected officials, former CIA and FBI officials, and others are calling for open sedition against the sitting president and violent revolution against him and his supporters. Just like it says in the book of Amos, God did warn us ahead of time. He did let us know what was coming if we did not repent. For over 12 plus years, Dimitri and his grandson, Michael Dia, traveled across this country calling people to repentance. They did go on the radio. They did go on television. They were on the internet. And even every once in a while, I go on the radio show with Mike Bodia, and we talk about some of these things. Dimitri has since, of course, gone on to the Lord, but Mike continues to call this nation to repentance. And not just Dimitri or Michael have called people to repentance, but many other pastors, faithful men and women of God, have been calling this nation to repentance for years. For most, their message, like the prophets of old, it fell on deaf ears. And now, judgment is at our gate. Amen. I like what Michael Dia had said in one of his radio broadcasts. He said that the election of Trump was not a pardon, but a stay of execution. Mm -hmm. We have not been pardoned. If you study the kings of old in Israel, Whenever they got a righteous king, the nation was spared for a time. But when an unrighteous king came to power, the nation went down again. The northern kingdom was destroyed quickly, but the southern kingdom persisted for a time because occasionally a righteous king would come and call the people back to repentance, call the people back to righteousness. But then once that king was gone, the nation went down again. And I believe what he said is true, that we were not given a pardon, but a stay of execution. I believe in God's mercy, He's still giving us all time to repent. Mm -hmm. Amen. I believe in His mercy, He's still giving us time to turn away from our sins and to turn to Him, to live a clean and holy and righteous life and yes, stop sir. sinning. Yes, sir. It's only been given a time. I don't know how long this is going to last. None of us do. God didn't give us a timetable. But he has given us an opportunity to repent. Amen. Dimitri, Mike, and many others have been blowing the trumpet trying to warn the people of what is to come. They were like the watchmen mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 33. In Ezekiel 33, 1 through 6, it says, Once again a message came to me from the Lord. Son of man, give your people this message. When I bring an army against the country, the people of that land choose one of their own to be a watchman. When the watchman sees the enemy coming, he sounds the alarm to warn the people. But if those who hear the alarm refuse to take action, it is their own fault if they die. They heard the alarm, but ignored it. So the responsibility is theirs. If they had listened to the warning, they could have saved their lives. But if the watchman sees the enemy coming and doesn't sound the, trump, sound the alarm to warn the people, he is responsible for their captivity. They will die in their sins, but I will hold the watchmen responsible for their deaths. I'm not a watchman like that of Ezekiel or Dimitri or Mike. But I feel compelled today to blow that trumpet of warning and repentance. I believe that from here on in, it will only get worse. Regardless as to how the November elections go, it's clear that we are seeing the precursor of another civil war. There are some history, historians that believe that we have moved past the precursors and have moved 
into what they call a soft civil war, which will grow hotter by the day. So what is the solution? What can we do? If judgment truly is at the door, what can we do? The solution to our present problem is the same as it was since the beginning. In the Bible, in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, 14, it says, If my people, which are called by my name, so humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and for, will forgive their sin and will heal their land. The first step to healing our land is the first step to healing our spirit. It's repentance. That's right. We must first repent. Notice the steps he mentioned in 2 Chronicles. Humble yourself. Pray. Seek his face. Turn from your wicked ways. Then will he heal your land. And only then. These are the steps of repentance. Only when you have done this that God will hear from heaven, forgive us of our sins, and then heal our land. This is the only solution to this crisis. Nothing else will work. Nothing. No political leader, no legislation, no economic package, no rally or march or political action. Nothing short of repentance will work. I fear, however, that most of those that call themselves by his name in this country will not do this, just like that of Israel. So regardless of what happens to this nation, the question I have for you today is, what will you do? Will you repent today? Now? Will you turn to Jesus now? Will you make him Lord and Savior of your life now? I hope you do so. Because you may not have tomorrow. You may not even have an hour from now. Who knows what's going to happen to this person? This may be the end of their day. I hope they repented. I hope so too. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you that you send us watchmen. You send us in prophets. You send us in people to warn us. You give us a stay of execution because you are a merciful God. You bless out of desire, but you punish out of necessity. You don't want to send judgment, but it is necessary. Thank you, Lord, that your long-suffering and your patience and your mercy are long. And we thank you, Lord, that you give us time. And Lord, I do pray that if there's anybody here that hears my voice today, and if they have not turned themselves over to you, Lord, that they'll do it today. Because we have no idea if we're going to have tomorrow. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.